piece of public policy this committee has seen this morning. I agree with you. <laughs> Two provisions, discontinues the requirements in current law uh, relative to the California earthquake early warning system and requires Cal OES to do some updates. I would respectfully ask for your eye vote. Very good. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns from the members? Seeing, hearing none. Uh, any, uh, you have any witnesses in support present? Devin Anderson on behalf of the American Red Cross in support. Very good. Mr. Chair, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the Computing Technology Industry Association in support. Thank you. Any others in support, please come forward. Paul Rosinski, we have the San Francisco Bay Area Transit District in support. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Any others, please come forward. Any uh, witnesses in opposition? It's been properly moved uh, upon the establishment of a quorum. We'll put this out. Would you like to close, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right. We are waiting on Mr. Cooper. Yeah, we're going to adjourn uh, in short order if the, uh, if the members of the lower house don't find their way over. Yeah. All right. So we'll call, uh, call roll. We'll establish a quorum. Hall. Present. Hall present. Berryhill. Bates. Here. Bates present. Block. Here. Block Here. present. Gaines. Galgiani. Galgiani present. Glazer. Hernandez. Here. Hernandez present. Hill. Hueso. Laura, McGuire, McGuire present, Vidak. Vidak present. All right, a quorum's been established. Let's take up uh, Mr. Gray's bill. It's been properly moved by Mr. Vidak. Motion is due pass and re refer to appropriations. Hall? Uh, I. Hall, I. Berryhill? Bates? I. Bates, I. Block? I. Block, I. Gaines? Galgiani? I. Galgiani, I. Glazer? Hernandez? I. Hernandez, I. Hill? Hueso? Laura? McGuire? I. McGuire, I. Vidak. Vidak, aye. Bill has seven. That bill has seven. We'll keep the roll open for the absent members. We'll move up to. Um, but let's move consent. Is there a motion? Uh, uh, moved by uh, Senator uh, Hernandez. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Consent consists of item number one, number six, number eight, 13, 14, 17, 18, and 19. Hall? Aye. Hall, I. Berryhill? Bates? Aye. Bates, I. Block? Aye. Block, I. Gaines? Galgiani? Aye. Galgiani, I. Glazer? Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, I. Hill? Hueso? Lara? McGuire? Aye. McGuire, I. Vidak? Aye. Vidak, I. Consent is out. Uh, we'll move to... Item 16, uh, Mr. Chu, please come forward. Good morning. Mr. Chairman and Senators, I appreciate your consideration of AB 2739, which is a district bill to make a small technical change to current law concerning the issuing of ABC licenses for historic theaters in my city of San Francisco. 
The current law was passed in 2013 by our San Francisco colleague, Mr. Ting, which allowed three historic theaters in San Francisco to have an on-sale general ABC license. Unfortunately, current law didn't contemplate the possibility that the ownership of one of these theaters might change hands, which leaves the new owner without a new license unless the license for the other two theaters were canceled. This bill is supported by our entire San Francisco delegation. It simply deletes that technical requirement that the other licenses be canceled to allow the historic Kern Theater, which opened in 1922 and recently changed ownership to apply for a license. Now, I just want to mention that unlike other bills that the committee might be considering this morning, this bill doesn't increase the number of venues that would sell alcohol in San Francisco. It is intended to keep the status quo. So with that, I do have a witness, uh, Mr. Hart from the current theater to help testify in support. Good morning. My name is Tom Hart and uh, I represent the uh, Shorenstein Hayes family members who are the owners of the current theater. And I wanna thank you, Mr. Chair and um, members for this opportunity to uh, uh, consider it. Um, I know that uh, uh, this theater was built in the 1920s, it's historic, and through the decades it's uh, provided thousands of people with uh, live Broadway entertainment. And uh, in January of 19, uh, of, excuse me, of 2015, uh, Carol Shorenstein Hayes, one of the owners, closed the theater to give it a much needed renovation and, uh, and facelift. And that will be completed by the end of this year. And so we're seeking to reopen in January with our first Broadway musical coming back. And um, we hope that we're able to afford our customers uh, the usual uh, courtesies of alcoholic beverages. So thank you very much again and um, available for any questions. Right. Um, any other witnesses in support? Thanks in alcohol justice, we remove our opposition. Thank you. Okay, any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? All right, um, so explain the, how, does, how this does not uh, increase or expand. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, if I may, John Latimer on behalf of the current theater. Um, the original authorizing legislation passed by uh, the legislature two years ago authorized a limited number of licenses for the specific numbers, a number of for-profit theaters that qualified in San Francisco. It's based on the type of theater and it was also based on the number of seats in a for-profit theater. So there are definitions in the bill that effectively limited that ting piece of legislation to three locations. What, what, so we're not expanding the number of locations in this bill that could otherwise be, be authorized. We did put a provision in the bill, and, and again, I wasn't working on that original piece of legislation, but there was a phrase that we're now removing that was put into the bill two years ago that effectively limited the ability for the landowner, one of those three landowners, to be able to secure their own license if the license in question was uh, no longer under their control. Throughout ABC law, we allow sort of the dominant control to be the landowner, whoever's property it is, is the one who is able to go forth and seek a license. Without this change, as, as the remodel is done at the current theater, the current theater would not be able to go in and seek its own license. Should this bill pass, which we would like it to, should this bill pass, the current theater will go in and seek a license. That will still only be three licenses in effect under this statute as originally envisioned. There is no expansion. We're changing sort of the operating rules around the limits that were already created two years ago. We're not changing the limits. We're not expanding the number at all. So why is this license necessary then? So um, this, this uh, piece of legislation two years ago, we created uh, a set of expanded criteria for a license for, for these for-profit theaters in San Francisco. Um, without, uh, without this change, we would have to go forth and seek 
a different license with more limited privileges than are available at the Orpheum and the Golden Gate, the other two theaters that are in existence, we'd have to go seek a, a different license than those two have. So we, we, without this change, we cannot get access to the license on our own, to the license that the Ting bill originally envisioned two years ago. So we need that one change so that the department may look at our license and our application and, and judge it on its merits. It doesn't guarantee us a license, allow us to go through the licensing process on our own. If I could, if I could just add to that, a few years ago, it was one holding company that operated these three theaters. That one holding company had applied for the license, so all three theaters were allowed to sell alcohol. One of those three theaters is now independently owned and operated by Curran. Because of the way the rules are set up, um, that one theater can no longer continue to sell license uh, to, to, to sell alcohol unless this specific change is made, which would have required the other two theaters to give up their license in order for the current to get a new license. So essentially what we're asking for is the effective status quo of allowing all three theaters to continue to sell alcohol, but we need this technical change. All right. Um, any questions, comments, concerns from the members? Okay. Um, you've cleared up, Mr. Latimer, some of my concerns earlier uh, or questions. Typically, I don't like, as you guys know, I don't like giving out liquor licenses technically. Um, but the, this is an ex this is obviously uh, a a little deviation from you know my principles uh, here. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and allow the bill to move forward. Um, the bill has been moved by uh, Mr. Senator McGuire. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Motion is due pass and re refer to appropriations. Hall? Uh, Hall, aye. Hall, aye. Berryhill? Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Gaines? Aye. Gaines, aye. Galgiani? Aye. Galgiani, aye. Glazer? Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, aye. Waiso? Hill? Lara? McGuire? Aye. Mag McGuire, aye. Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. Okay. That has eight. That has eight. Uh, we'll keep the uh, roll open for absent members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank right. you, Senators. Uh, item five has been pulled from the calendar. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cooper, come on up. 10 and 11. And what item is Cooper? 10 and 11. And you're presenting on AB 1971, item 10, and also uh, item 11, AB 2011. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. First, I would like to accept the technical amendments recommended in the analysis. Over the past 20 years, plus years, numerous exceptions to the Tide House laws have been enacted to allow manufacturers or suppliers to pay for advertising or become sponsors of a variety of entertainment venues. Each exemption is very specific as to describe a certain facility based on the type of facility and its seating capacity. These exceptions have been handled piecemeal over the years through separate pieces of legislation. AB 1971 is sponsored by the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control and will streamline the process so that new venues will no longer need to have legislation to purchase advertising or sponsor venues while maintaining protections since the ABC will continue to have the authority to investigate any complaints of alcohol related violations at these stadiums. I urge and I vote. Right, very good. Uh, Mr. Cooper, you have any witnesses? And by the way, you did uh, accept the committee amendments, correct? Correct. All right, so Secretary, please note. Um, and are there any witnesses in support? Please come forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, member Scott Wetch on behalf of the Stronach Group, uh, owners of Golden Gate Fields and uh, um, Santa Anita in support of the bill. Thank you. That's the wrong bill, Mr. Wretch. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, come back. Just stand by. Stand by for a second. <laughs> All right. Any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition, please come forward. Uh, any comments, concerns from the members? Is the, uh, we had a motion for the bill. Well, Mr. Cooper, would you like to close? Respectfully, yes, for your I vote. Uh, the bill has been moved by Senator Galgiani. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Motion is due pass as amended and re-referred to appropriations. Hall? Hall, aye. Hall, aye. Berryhill? 
Bates. Aye. Bates, I Block. Aye. Block, I Gaines. Aye. Gaines, I Galgiani. Aye. Galgiani, I Glazer. Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez, I Hill. Hueso. Lara. McGuire. Aye. McGuire, I Vidak. Aye. Vidak, I. All right. Uh, Mr. Cooper, that bill has eight. We'll keep the roll open for absent members. Uh, and now we'll move on to uh, item 11, uh, AB 2011. Thank you, Mr. Chair. AB 2011 supports the Northern California horse racing industry by restructuring the stabling and vanning fund, which is currently operating in a deficit. Specifically, the bill increases the deduction from purses and commissions from 1.2% to 2% allows excess funds to be returned to the purses and commissions each year, provides parties more flexibility in governance and decision making, and only impacts the Northern California horse racing industry. I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Okay, uh, uh, any witnesses in support? Mr. Wetch, good morning, sir. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Scott Wetch, on behalf of the Stoner Group, owner of Golden Gate Fields, um, this is something that's badly needed in the industry to upgrade our facilities. Uh, we think it will pay huge dividends to the industry, and we would urge an I vote. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Louis Brown, on behalf of the California Authority of Racing Fairs, uh, in support and sponsor of the bill. Very good. Any other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Um, so I have a similar bill. I have a very, in fact, the very same bill moving through uh, the legislature as we speak. Um, and as we, as the bills move forward, we we'll probably have to merge the two. I have absolutely, I have absolutely no ownership of the bill, uh, and I would probably ask you be the primary uh, as that bill moves forward. All right, just so that the bills don't zigzag, uh, and you can uh, move the bill as a primary as we move forward. Absolutely. Okay. All right, any questions, comments, concerns from the members? Is there a motion on the bill? The bill has been moved by Senator uh, Vidak. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Motion is due pass and re refer to appropriations. Hall? Hall, aye. Hall, aye. Berryhill? Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Gaines? Aye. Gaines, aye. Galgiani? Aye. Galgiani, aye. Glazer? Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, aye. Hill? Hueso? Lara? McGuire? Aye. McGuire, aye. Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. All right. Congratulations. That bill's out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, come on up, Ms. Sen uh, Assemblywoman Irwin. Assemblywoman, you're presenting on item 7, AB 1841. And um, I'm sorry, I, item 3, AB 1554. Item 7, AB 1841. And that's it. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. First, I would like to thank the committee for passing SB 819, Senator Huff's companion bill, which passed out of this committee with unanimous support. AB 1554 defines powdered alcohol and bans the possession, use, sale, and manufacture of it in California. Powdered alcohol poses a health and safety risk because of its strong appeal to youth and the ability to fortify alcoholic drinks to dangerous levels. 32 states, including New York, have already banned this dangerous product. Youth binge drinking and alcohol-related deaths are epidemic in California. The introduction of a new form of alcohol that is easily concealable and attractive to youth will exacerbate these problems. We need to act now to prevent unnecessary health and public safety dangers posed by uh, powdered alcohol. All right. Um, Some of them, you have witnesses uh, to testify in support of the bill. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Dr. Nancy Williams. I'm a public health officer for El Dorado County and a member of the county's Health and Human Services executive team. I support AB 1554, as do the El Dorado County Board of Supervisors and the Health Officers Association of California. We all agree that powdered alcohol is a bad idea for public health, our communities, our patients, and our children. You have already heard from others on this topic, so to avoid repetition, I want to focus instead on some statistics from the 2011 to 13 California Healthy Kids Survey and some national statistics. Alcohol is the most commonly used and abused substance among youth in the United States. 
Underage drinking has a huge societal cost. It is a factor in many needless underage deaths and ER visits and results in huge economic costs. Even though alcohol is illegal for people under 21 years of age, underage drinkers account for 11% of all alcohol consumed in the United States, and more than 90% of this alcohol is con consumed as binge drinking. On average, underage drinkers consume more drinks per occasion than adult drinkers. In California specifically, by 11th grade, 59% of students have reported ever trying alcohol, and 31% had drunk in the past month. More than 10% say their typical level of intoxication is to get really drunk, and more than 20% said they had binged in the past month. Even 5% of 7th graders had binged in the past month. This is scary. Powdered alcohol hardly seems like something that would be safe around underage drinkers. Youth who drink alcohol are also more likely to experience school problems such as absenteeism and poor grades, legal problems such as arrests and alcohol-related driving or violence, risky sexual activity, higher suicide and homicide risks, and more. Considering all the existing issues with alcohol, why would we want to add yet another potential source to the mix? I urge you, I urge you to support AB 1554. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we have another witness. Uh, good morning. You may, con you may continue, sir. Uh, good morning, Chairman Hall and members of the committee. I'm Bruce Livingston, the Executive Director and CEO of Alcohol Justice. I'm also representing the California Alcohol Policy Alliance, a new statewide coalition dedicated to preventing alcohol-related harm. AB 1554 is a straightforward, simple piece of legislation that bans the sale and possession of powdered alcohol with a small fine. The bill is to protect the, uh, the health and safety of California's youth. Um, Alcohol and other forms of powdered alcohol essentially look and act like Kool-Aid. Um, it's in packaging that looks like a juice squeeze container or a, or a container of Kool-Aid that is easy to conceal, um, such as this one here, which looks exactly like this is Kool-Aid, actually. But it, <laughs> this is what the uh, container w uh, could look like. Um, it could be spiked on ice cream. It could be put in liquids at parties. Uh, it's easily stolen. It's by its very nature attractive to youth. It's sweet um, and um, uh, nice fruity flavors. With less water than advised, it could be very high potency and uh, cause binge drinking very easily. It would be sold as a spirits product. Um, there's no doubt that it's really meant for youth in our communities. Um, and um, we're just overwhelmed by the support that's been shown in the uh, support column here and um, really um, are so glad that this uh, committee has already um, passed SB 8, uh, 19 and, and we look forward to your support. Thanks. Thank you. And Fred Jones on behalf of the California Council on Alcohol Problems in strong support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Mr. Chairman and members, Barry Broad on behalf of the Teamsters in support of the bill. I think Powdered alcohol is a really, really bad idea. I, I'm trying to understand why you say that because I, you just just drinking it the other day. <laughs> Was that what we were doing? <laughs> Good morning, I can't Aaron. Take you anywhere, Mr. World. <laughs> Aaron Lewis for the Consumer Federation of California in support. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole Wordelman on behalf of the Ventura County Board of Supervisors in support. Rosanna Carvacho on behalf of the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, also in support. Thank you. Michelle Gibbons with the County Health Executives Association, in support. Mike Skip on behalf of the San Francisco Prevention Coalition and the San Francisco Health Improvement Partnerships, in support. Mr. Chairman and other members, Paul Yoder on behalf of the Boards of Supervisors in Placer and Sonoma Counties, in support. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Uh, witnesses in opposition? Um, so how many states have already banned? I know we heard this bill before last year, a similar it's, bill. It's 32. There was a chart back there. I don't it's know. Everything oh. in red right behind oh. you. Okay, there it is. It's behind me. Yeah. Um, and uh, do you see or know if the other states are following the lead? And the ones who have not banned, have not banned already, are they also looking to ban? Well, in addition, I believe it's four or five other states, including D.C., and uh, the only states that are moving forward with uh, legalizing it are, uh, I believe, uh, yeah, Colorado, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, Texas, there's a mass producer that wants to put it behind the bars, so it's a potential business source. Uh, Arizona is the, uh, the home of uh, Lipsmark, uh, Mark Phillips, the owner of Palcohol. 
And Colorado, anything goes these days. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is it uh, a way of keeping it out of the hands of children, or is it just unsafe, period? I, th I think it's really both, but this is so clearly aimed at children. It's very easy to conceal, to bring into schools, to bring into concerts. Um, and that is really the number one concern. Mm -hmm. Which is a great concern. Um, well, and, and I mean, we've heard this statistic many times. If you're binge drinking by age 15, you're something like three or four times more likely to become an alcoholic. So th there is a reason that government needs to regulate this dangerous product. Have you found or discovered any deaths associated with uh, specifically powdered alcohol? This just uh, powdered alcohol just became legalized, uh, approved by the FDA last year. So we, you know, most states have not allowed it yet. And so I can't necessarily say that there's been any um, deaths associated with it, but certainly acute alcohol poisoning where we're over drinking on one uh, episode is, is, it's an epidemic mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any other comments, concerns? Like yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Senator Gates. Yeah, thank you, Assemblywoman Irwin, for bringing this forward. And I was just curious in terms of um, how are young adults getting it? Are they buying it on the internet or? Um, it's it's really um, not being sold in California yet. Okay. So. But I, I think this is kind of the toothpaste that you don't want to let out of the tube. I, I know the author had said, well, why don't we just regulate it? But once it once it's in the state, I think that you're going to see tremendous problems. We've seen this with other dangerous substances before that um, FDA did not want to regulate it. Specifically, if you talk about energy drinks with alcohol, mm -hmm. it was legal. Nobody was, you know, everybody could see that there would be, you know, a potential potential catastrophe. And sure enough, it, it did happen up okay. in the state of Washington. And then the F FDA moved to um, ban uh, energy drinks that had alcohol mixed okay. in. So this is this is just trying to get ahead of it Proactive. and not put yeah. any more gas on the fire. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very Thank good. You. The bill has been moved uh, by Senator Block. Would you like to close? Just respectfully ask for your eye vote. All right, very well. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Motion is due pass and re referred to appropriations. Hall? Uh, yes. Hall, aye. Berryhill? Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Block? Aye. Block, aye. Gaines? Aye. Gaines, aye. Galgiani? Aye. Galgiani, aye. Glazer? Hernandez? Aye. Hernandez, aye. Hill? Hueso? Laura? McGuire? Aye. McGuire, aye. Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. Okay, that has eight. We'll keep the roll open for absent members. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now on item 7, uh, 1841. Yes, thank you. Um, AB 1841 will provide cybersecurity incident response planning within the state government of California. California conducts incident response planning for other types of emergencies, such as fires, earthquakes, or public health disasters. And that planning has protected our public safety and economy many times by leveraging federal and local resources and guiding our response efforts. <coughs> But despite a multi-year effort to create such a plan for cybersecurity, we have yet to do so. Ensuring that these preparations are made for cybersecurity will make our state networks more resilient. Research and real-world examples of cybersecurity disruptions have shown that by improving response coordination, recovery time and costs are reduced, and ultimately the amount of damage is limited. According to a Pell Center report on state cybersecurity, Six other states have established incident response plans for cybersecurity incidents, while California's plan remains incomplete. AB 1841 addresses this important security issue that we have recognized as a priority and will establish standards to keep our public networks, networks prepared. Thank you. Any comments, concerns? You know, I'm sorry, let's go to witnesses. Okay. Why are you here? He's helping me. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Any other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition other than Austin? Austin's going to answer, yeah. Okay. Uh, any uh, <laughs> comments, concerns from the members, Mr. McGuire? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and do appreciate the assemblywoman for bringing this forward. Just had a couple of quick questions. One is just um, if you can go in 
on the alignment, right, with where the governor was at last year uh, and where you're trying to be able to align, better align OES and where the governor wanted to be able to move. Can you just go into that and just want to talk some well, technical? Well, we have well. been, we were at OES last week. I mean, certainly this is their plan that they've been working on this incident response to, um, uh, plan for a number of months. This is just really having them accelerate their effort and making sure that we have a deadline. And um, my staff met last Friday with the governor's office also. So we, this is fully in alignment with uh, with what they want to do. And then, um, and I appreciate the, the questions here. And, and the other item is in regards to OES, and then I think OES is offering up uh, some amendments as well, and that's and that works for the bill, correct? Can you just uh, go into those? Right. Um, we we are looking at amendments that might align terminology, nothing to change the policy. So we are. Like I said, we're com totally working with OES and with the governor's office to make sure that um, this is good ar all around. I think we all have, we we all are settled on the policy. Great, I appreciate it, and again, appreciate you bringing this forward. Thank, Thank you, so Senator. Much. Any other questions, comments, concerns? What what took so long for for the department to move uh, this forward? Uh, well, you know, this is cybersecurity is is really evolving, and if you look at a couple of years ago, there really wasn't a focus on it until you had probably the big Sony breach, the big OPM breach. So states are a little bit behind in their efforts, and specifically here in California, we have had uh, a leadership mm -hmm. transition. Mm -hmm. And um, but there is now with a couple of bills that were passed last year, and with um, the oversight hearings that we've had, there's definitely a focus on on getting it done. And when you talk to OER, Oh, yes, they, you know, they really want to be in a position where they can say California is leading uh, the nation. And we're not quite there yet, but um, you know, this is part of the whole um, plan to get California where it needs to be on cybersecurity. Very good. Thank you for your leadership on this. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, move the bill. But the bill has been moved by Mr. McGuire. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Motion is due pass and re-refer to the Judiciary Committee. Hall. Aye. Hall I. Berryhill. Bates. Aye. Bates I. Block. Aye. Block I. Gaines. Aye. Gaines I. Galgiani. Glazer. Hernandez. Aye. Hernandez I. Hill. Weso. Laura. McGuire. Aye. McGuire I. Vidak. Vidak I. Thank you very much. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, Mr. Math, uh, Mathis is uh, uh, chief or is present uh, to present on item five, four. item four, AB 1558. 